Uh, thank you for joining me this evening, everyone. My name is Ken Rosenthal. I'm a park naturalist at Gulf Branch Nature Center, uh, and we're going to talk about the insects that really, really can hurt. Um, so let's get started without any further ado. Oh, uh, let me share my screen so you can see what I'm about to do. That's the important part here. So quick question, because I don't I realize I've done many of these and I don't think I've asked this. Um, if someone wants to just chime in briefly, can you as my screen's going, can everybody see what I see me as I'm talking? Yeah, I, I can see you as a thumbnail. Perfect. At the bottom. Thank you, because I might I might do something with my hands. I just want to make sure everybody can see it. And so we know I know if I'm doing it that people can actually see it. All right, so um, tonight we're going to talk about uh, stinging insects. Um, since I started as a naturalist, I became much more interested in insects um, and I had to go through a few uh, growing pains with with everything that has more legs than us. Um, some struggles with spiders, which obviously are not insects, um, but that was a, a very much a fear of my own as a kid. But also um, what I learned was that a lot of these stinging insects just really don't care about us as long as we're not overly um, close. As long as we, you know, essentially respect the, the boundaries that they may or may not have. Uh, most of them just don't have a lot of interest in us. Um, and so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about what it what it really is to be stung. What's going on as we um, or, or what's going on with the insects? Like, you know, why do they sting? Uh, do they want to sting? And then um, tackle a couple of the myths that, that come along with these as well. So uh, hopefully this is new and interesting stuff for everybody. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is a um, I'll try to name some of them as I go through because I tried to. For me, whenever I talk about Paul, let me start that sentence over for me, whenever I talk about pollinators, a lot of people in the back of their heads just go right to bees. And I think a lot of people do the same thing with stinging insects, but there's such an incredible diversity out there that I try to do uh, as many of these other ones as, as I can. And um, some of the names I remember, some of them just have Latin names that I may not um, remember, but I'll try to name them as I can. This is a great golden digger wasp, which is a really, really pretty wasp. And obviously you can see it's uh, nectaring on goldenrod in this particular uh, photo. But again, as, as I mentioned, you know, if you talk about stinging insects, I think a lot of people go to honeybees and they go to bumblebees. Those are fairly common. They're fairly well understood. Um, when you start learning about insects in grade school, they often go to ants, they often go to uh, honeybees, and they often go to uh, butterflies. Um, they're insects you see every day, um, <laughs> except for the honeybee, they're kind of safe, unless you're dealing with fire ants. Um, but generally, you know, they're talking about insects that are familiar with you. Um, but when they also do that, what I think that happens, and again, it's also, you know, if you're starting this at first grade, there's only so much you can tackle, but you miss out on a lot of the diversity there. So when we talk about stinging insects, we will talk about bees, but we're also going to talk about a few other things. Now for, again, for many people, honeybees are a really important pollinator, and so are bumblebees of, of native plants, and so those might be some of the first ones that, that pop into people's heads. Um, or the first one that pops in your head when you mention a stinging insect might be the one that tagged you the last time. It could be one of the paper wasps, like this dark um, paper wasp here in the last or on the left, or it could be um, a something like a bald faced hornet, uh, which is this this one here looking for some wood to to munch on the right. Um, and of course, yellow jackets, are, I'm sure, are on everybody's list of insects they'd rather not encounter uh, much at all. <clears throat> so I, I really, if, if you've done a few of these with me, you know I like my definitions and I like my big words. And I wasn't going to do this, but after I read the definition, just because I couldn't help myself, I thought it'd be fun to still put it up there. And this is from Webster. This isn't from a, a science dictionary or a biology or a zoology dictionary. Uh, this is, you know, everyday dictionary full of words. Um, and I love that the first subcategory under the first definition of sting was to pierce or wound with a poisonous or irritating process. OK, and that's where the word stinger comes from. And so we're talking about critters that are going to pierce or sting. Now, because I read this to you, because I read this and then because I read this to you, I have to add one more clarification on because poison is not the correct word. Um, and I don't know how many of you have encountered this with me, but uh, I used to sit right by the copperhead and I felt the need to. I, I did this talk a lot um, with people that were right next to my desk talking about the poisonous copperhead that was there. 
effect. The difference between poison and venom is the difference in the delivery method. Excuse me. <clears throat> and it's really about, <clears throat> in this example at least, who bit who. Um, poison is ingested. So in order to get poisoned, you need to eat something. It can also be absorbed through the skin. <clears throat> so ingested is not the entirely um, the, the end all be all for poison, but it comes in. Um, I don't know if even willingly is the right word, but it, it, it tends to come in through ingestion or absorption, and that's poison. Venom is injected. That's forcefully put in there. You know, you obviously usually against the um, uh, the individual's uh, hopes or dreams or wants or cares. Uh, and so venom is something that you get from a bite or you get from a sting. Um, so when we're talking about stinging insects, we're pretty much talking about venom and, and venomation um, as we go through uh, the talk this evening. So and, and uh, you know, just to, to make sure we're staying in our wheelhouse, um, because there's actually a lot of, of really interesting uh, stinging information out there. We're going to focus on stinging insects. So we're not going to talk about any other stinging arthropods. Uh, obviously, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a few things as we come through here. Uh, scorpions are well known. They have that um, final appendage on the end of their tail that has a stinger on it with its own venom glands. Um, some can be really, really bad news. Some can be nothing more than a bee sting. Um, again, the, the, the reaction to the venom of any kind of stinger bite really depends on the species in, that stings or bites us. Our personal, our, our species is our species's sensitivity to that. And then there's also personal sensitivity. So obviously some people have more of a reaction to certain kinds of bites or stings or even an allergy, which can really compound or complicate uh, that wound or injury. Um, and also, and I thought this was interesting as I was looking up stingers. They mentioned centipedes, and, and it took me a second to really consider that, but centipedes do not have mouth parts. They're fang, or I'm sorry, they don't have fangs in the, the true sense of, of like teeth. The first pair of legs on a centipede are actually modified into fangs. So really they're piercing you with their front pair of modified legs and injecting venom, and that is actually much more like a sting. Um, the word sting initially was coined to describe the bite from a, a venomous snake. It was probably called a poisonous snake, uh, but a venomous snake. Um, and we all know now that that is, is very much incorrect, but that's initially um, what the word sting was used for. And now it's come to mean, um, you know, some of these other critters here like um, scorpions, uh, bees and wasps and, and other stinging insects. Uh, this is in, in case you're not worth recognizing it, by the way, this is a close up of a house centipede, which are pretty common around here and they're fairly cosmopolitan around the world. <clears throat> uh, we're not talking about sting stinging fishes. Again, we're sticking with insects. Um, this is a stingray. You can see there that that nice um, sting that would really, really be painful. And the interesting about this is stingrays like sharks are cartilaginous, so they don't have bone. So that stinger is a cartilaginous structure. And you can see on the right here a little close up of it. And um, that is a those are centimeters, I believe. So it's a nine centimeter a sting that would um, that would hurt. And they are also they do also have uh, venom in there, which just seems really mean because you've already got this fish that's just jabbed this really sharp piece of cartilage in your leg, and then it's going to pump in a little bit of venom to boot. Um, because this is, I, as far as I understand, very much defensive. You're not going to have a lot of, uh, there isn't any kind of other benefit from uh, getting envenomated from a stingray for, for the stingray. Um, obviously, it's d definitely uh, and very much a defensive thing. Uh, and generally, um, Stingray stings are not terribly uh, dangerous unless you get stuck in the wrong place or get stuck next to a very important organ. Um, most people are probably you may or may not be thinking of Steve Irwin at this point, the, the crocodile hunter who um, got tagged with by a stingray, unfortunately, right in the chest near his heart. And um, that was his last um, was his last nature outing. Uh, it was very unfortunate. But again, typically this is not something that happens. This is not something that um, is a very serious injury. It's not fun and it's very painful. Uh, but when you get hit where he did next to the heart, um, that can be it can become a whole different um, kind of emergency. Uh, not talking about stinging jellyfishes. This is another group of organisms, the jellyfishes, cnidarians, which are very, you know, are classified by having stinging cells or nematocysts. Um, these are bay nettles. This is from uh, flag ponds in uh, the Chesapeake Bay. 
Uh, and these these guys are, you know, minor stings. It, it hurts my ditch for a little while. It's not going to it's nothing that, um, you know, typically is going to be something that requires urgent medical care, but it's not going to be comfortable. Uh, and we're not even talking about irritating insects. Um, these are caterpillars. If you look at their uh, the structures, you can see on the left is a saddleback. On the right is a slug caterpillar, right? The slug moth caterpillar, if you think I remember correctly. Um, and that caterpillar on the right is uh, probably not with us uh, anymore at the point of this photograph because you can see it's been parasitized by wasps, which we'll be talking about. Um, but all these little, on both of these pictures, you can see that they have what look like little Christmas tree structures all over their body. These are uh, hairs, or um, excuse me, they are, um, I worked on this now, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking, but they are, they're bristle-like structures, they're needle-like, they're very sharp, and if you touch them, it causes, and I don't think it's active, I think it's a passive mechanism, but if you touch them, it will um, change some physical structure inside there and causes venom to flow through that structure into your arm or hand or neck or foot or whatever you brush that that caterpillar with. And it can be quite painful. Um, I've only ever seen the saddleback once. I understand it's very painful to touch and I'm glad I never have. Um, and a lot of times you get hit, you get nailed by one of these accidentally you're brushing against vegetation. No idea that the caterpillar is there. You may never see it and it hurts a lot. Um, when I was a kid, I remember trying to spot a, a tree frog in a tree at scout camp and I'm pawing away at all these trees and something just felt like I got stabbed um it was a tulip tree so there wasn't i don't think anything that could have really gotten me that way uh, in the middle of july and um i have a feeling i might have touched one of a, a, a caterpillar like this or similar it hurt a little bit and then that was it it wasn't you know it didn't last for a long time um it definitely wasn't a saddleback because they are much more painful than that so but we're not going to talk about uh the irritating insects or irritating oops um or this one oh this is lanomia oblica this is from a group of silkworm moths uh, that are found in South America, and the venom from these spines is, is much more significant than in many others. Um, and if you were to get nailed by, say, 20 or 50 of these, if you ran into a little patch on the underside of a leaf, um, you could have serious danger uh, going. You could have serious effects, including hemolysis um, and failure of some organs. And in some rare cases, uh, people die. I say rare cases, and I'm realizing that I think they've attributed over 500 um deaths to them in south america um and so maybe it's not that rare but what happens is typically if you brush against one it's going to hurt and you're going to have you're going to experience that pain from that envenomation uh, but if it's only one or two it's not too bad but when you get multiple um envenomations from several of these caterpillars it, it becomes a really big deal and they'd known about this for a while but it really became an issue in the 80s um, and I think part of it was had to do with some climate change effects, but also loss of habitat. You know, the usual suspects when anything kind of goes funky in nature. Um, and they had a lot more encounters between people and they started to have these really serious effects. And it took them a while to connect the two and realize that it was this caterpillar, which was known to have a painful sting uh, and multiple um, caterpillar envenomations from multiple individuals that was producing this effect in people and so i think now this is currently um i haven't seen one of these books in a while um uh, but uh, if guinness is still making its world record books this is in the world record book as the most venomous caterpillar in the world uh and no irritating arthropods i swear we're getting the stinging insects uh not we're not going to talk about irritating arthropods you can see this shiny patch on the abdomen of this tarantula um they have something called urticating hairs which they can actually fling with their back legs uh and they can get if you get in your eye or, or into any of your mucous membranes it can be really really irritating and itchy and painful um but it is one of their um defenses because they are a small predator and so as much as they eat other organisms there's still other organism organisms that eat them as well and so um that's one of their defenses is to shoot these little um these irritating hairs off uh, a co-worker had um a class when i was in denver we had tarantulas we used for our programs um and it, nobody has ever had really much of a story with the the tarantula, all the kids seem to be on their best behavior on the tarantula, um, but she had one of the kids squeal and um, scare the tarantula, and it ran up her arm and was pew, 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 
firing off these hairs off its off its abdomen uh, in fear. And generally, you know, they're pretty calm and didn't do that, but they do have that uh, defense, which is interesting. No, we are going to stick with. Oh, and I forgot. Also, we're not talking about stinging mammals. And this is part of the reason I threw that um, definition in is because male platypus has a spur at the on its rear legs and they can jab you with that spur and it will envenomate you. Uh, and so um, I would consider that a stinging mammal, which is fantastic because until I started this uh, presentation, I hadn't even ever thought of that as a, uh, a way to describe it. So, but we are not going to talk about any of these guys. By the way, it's worth a Google to look up um, some of the injuries that people get from those because they can cause some pretty severe localized swelling. Again, not fatal, but a painful experience that you won't repeat, which is what these critters want. If they sting you, um, if they make you uncomfortable, it's to get you to leave them alone so that they can move on with their life and you're not going to come back and bother them. So we're going to stick with stinging insects. We've got a eastern yellow jacket here in the upper left in the middle of that bald faced hornet again. On the right is a carpenter bee. Uh, bottom middle is a, I think it's a Nearctic blue mud dauber. Uh, and on the left is one of the, it's a bee. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not sure. I don't remember which, which kind of bee that was. Um, so we're going to stick with the stinging insects. So what insects sting? Well, I'm going to go with the beetle to start. This is the only beetle we know of to sting. Um, if you look at those antennae on the end of the scorpion beetle, they look like they, they've got that shape, like the end of a scorpion tail, which is how it got its name. Other uh, beetles in the uh, in this genus don't seem to show have that that barbed tip on the antenna just as this one species um it's interesting that they've known that it can poke you i think since 1884 was what i was reading but it wasn't until 2005 that um a field researcher got got poked by one of these and it hurt and he said it kind of felt like a bee sting and he took the time to go to get a couple and figure out if there was anything coming out of those the ends of these antenna and there actually was and so there are little there is a little venom that comes out of these of the ends of the antenna and so it is a stinging insect uh it's the only beetle i found any evidence of that does who knows there could be some out there and we just don't know or we haven't it hasn't been documented uh but this is the one uh insect outside of the group we're going to talk about which is hymenoptera uh, they're animals, obviously, uh, in the uh, group of arthropods. They're insects, which means they have six legs, three main body sections, two pairs of wings, and that pair of wings is where they get their uh, order name. Uh, you'll find a lot of orders of insects end with Optera, like Coleoptera, uh, Diptera ends with, you know, again, they end with those five letters. So, sorry, not Optera, but the Terra, the P T E R A. Uh, hymenoptera, coleoptera, diptera, um, and what that that root terra means wing. Well, hymen means marriage. These are Greek words for hymen and optera, uh, which means you know marriage wing. Uh, and what that's actually saying is there's a series of hooks uh, called hamuli, hamuli, H-A-M-U-L-I, um, that connect the front wing to the back wing, so that the wing is sexually act, the wing is sexually flaps and acts as one. Um, Let's see them up close. Here's a, an electron micro. Uh, here's a microscopic image of it. So each of these these curved hooks here, these are what are connecting the front wing to the back. I believe they're on. Um, that's a really good question. I think they're on the back wing and keep it in tune with the front wing, but it could be the other way around. Uh, but they connect the two wings, these structures, and that's where the, the, the term hymenoptera comes from. Um, so you'll see them flapping and it might look like they only have two wings, but they actually have four. Uh, diptera or the flies are the ones that only have one wing, hence die and terra for two wings. Um, so here's kind of a look at hymenoptera in, in clades. This is a clad cladogram of the different um, clades or, or classifications of uh, the insects that are in the hymenoptera. Soft flies up here at the top are really, um, they don't sting, they're really, really um, primitive example of hymenoptera, uh, but they're pretty common. Their larvae actually look like caterpillars, uh, and so sometimes they get mistaken for that. Um, but what we're really looking at, we're not going to look at the Orosoidea, Stephanoidea, the Ichneumonoidea. We're kind of staying here just below where it says non-singing wasps, wasps in the, uh, I don't even know how to say it, A-C-U-L-E-A-T-A, -A -A, um, which I guess means stinger, but that is the group we're kind of sticking into here. And again, 
It's a yellow jackets, paper wasp, hornets. Uh, there's also ants, which some ants do sting, and bees and other kinds of and sphecoid wasps. Um, the mutility, these are uh, velvet ants. If you've ever heard of a cow killer, um, it's a big, fuzzy, red and black. Looks like a big red ant, but it's actually a wingless wasp. And it's called a cow killer because supposedly its sting was so painful, it was thought it could kill a cow, which I think is a really, um, it shows a, a little lack of introspective. You're like, yeah, that sting would hurt a lot. Probably could kill a cow. Not me, of course, but it could definitely kill a cow. Um, but they had to have a very painful sting. And there's a whole family, this whole family of utility is um, these wasps, and many of them are wingless. Uh, and they're, they're really, really pretty or cri and, um, colored. And I'll talk more about what that coloration means a little later on. It's important to remember that in the group of bees, um, obviously you could see that some hymenoptera are not stingers. They're also within that circle. There are some wasps and bees that that do not sting. This is a red-tailed stingless bee. Uh, this is uh, a critter in Central America. This one right, it's on Costa Rica. I remember seeing one of their nests um, walking between. Uh, I was staying at, at a hotel and on a birding trip and walking from my room to the the um, the bar area to eat and walking by and thinking, oh, I got to tell other people that. And the first person I told was my guy, and he was like, yeah, those those don't sting. Um, which I'm not used to. I'm pretty sure that a lot of most of our bees sting, whether they do or not, it's a different story. Um, but that made me take a whole closer look um, at that colony, which was nice. Um, but there are, again, some stingless bees out there. Most people seem to remember the ones that, that cause us pain. So um, in some hymenoptera, the stinger is a modified ovipositor. An ovipositor is an egg laying organ. Uh, these are obviously not hymenoptera. I got a uh, katydid on the right and some grasshoppers on the left. Uh, on the right of this katydid, this is a female, and you can tell it's a female because it, she's got what looks like a sword sticking out of the end of her abdomen, and that is her ovipositor. Uh, that is what she uses. That is, um, I should say that. That is, I think technically that's actually the sheath inside, which is the ovipositor. The ovipositor is the tube that they use to lay eggs. Um, and then obviously the, hopefully you guys can see this caterpillar, or the caterpillar, Carolina grasshoppers here on the left. Um, the female has her abdomen in the soil and she's using, because she's got her abdomen down in there because she has her ovipositor down in there and she's laying eggs. Um, I initially, when I first saw this, thought that the male and the female were mating, but if her abdomen is down there, they're probably not mating anymore. So I'm not sure if the male's uh, mate guarding, uh, and making sure no one else tries to mate with her, or if he's a mate, he's trying to come in and mate late and he's already missed his chance. Um, but again, the ovipositor is an egg laying organ. OK, here is an electron micrograph scan of a, uh, a eastern yellow jacket. Um, a stinger, so what I want you to see is it's in its sheath. So it's it's the sheaths inside. There are two parts to each of these stingers, and I'll show you that in the next slide. There's a there's the she, um, don't think the stylus, and then there's two lancets. Uh, and what I want you to notice, and hopefully you all can see my um, uh, cursor. What I want you to see is there is a, a ridge, almost like a saw-like ridge here, uh, on these each of these lancets, one on each side. Uh, and that's important for how these these work. So here's a sting of a queen wasp. This is Vespula vulgaris, which is actually a, a, a European species. Um, it's one that hasn't made our soil yet, so I should think we should be happy about that. Um, this is the stylus, and then you've got two lancets here. And if you'll notice again, these lancets, just like those other ones, have the almost like that, um, you know, hooks are almost like the uh, the saw teeth there. And what happens is when the stinger goes in. To whatever it's going into, whether it's wood or whether it's 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 flesh, you know you've got these barbs here, and you can think of it as almost like if you put your fingers in and you're like wiggling in, and you go back and forth, okay, to get something in between your hands. That's what they're doing. Except those those um, saw teeth are catching whatever tissue that is and gripping, and then the next one goes in grips, and the next one goes in. So they kind of antagonistic to each other, but they keep going in. And again, all this happens re rapidly. You don't feel that when it happens, although you feel pain. Um, but that's what happens when uh, that's how the stinger goes in. And it's inserting the stylus, and through that will come the ovipositor, um, or would come the ovipositor if um, they were laying eggs, or it's just uh, a stinger develop, gener um, de developing, delivering uh, venom. So, one of the things I think that most of us are familiar with, obviously, is honeybees and, and their stings. So on the left is a honeybee stinger. Um, 
when it becomes detached from the female, uh, it also includes the venom glands and even some ganglia. Ganglia are uh, kind of primitive. There, it's a cluster of neurons or neuro nerve cells, so it's a um, very primitive uh, brain type of organ, uh, and it will keep this pumping. So even after the 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 bee has tried to retract its stinger and it's more she's mortally wounded, um, this stinger can still pump more venom in through. Uh, you know, through the uh, ovipositor here, the modified ovipositor in your skin. So if you get stung by one of them and it comes out, get that out of your skin right away. Uh, ideally, not breaking that often so you don't also add infection to your list of, of, of problems, uh, but get that out of your skin before it keeps pumping more venom. So hopefully you have less of a, um, less of an issue with, with your wound. Uh, and again, here you can see with the honeybee here, um, I don't like the word design when I say this, but the um, there is a weakness to some of these tissues surrounding that stinger so that if the bee pulls too hard, it will release it. It, it seems to me like a, a, a flaw because the, the bee usually doesn't survive from that. Um, so I'm not sure what the, what the real benefit is, but leaving that stinger in well, the benefit is probably whoops. The benefit is probably to the high because leaving that stinger in, it's still pumping. It's going to make an even more painful wound and whatever that organism is that was trying to mess around with the honeybee hive is hopefully not going to mess around with it anymore. Um, <clears throat> the venom of bee sting contains uh, these six things here, histamine, mast cell, degranulating peptide, malignin, phospholipidase, uh, A2 hyaluronidase and acid phosphatase. I don't expect any of it to be like, yeah, 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 yeah. I met those guys at the party last week. No, um, what I wanted to show was that these are some of the ingredients in, in the venom, uh, and these last three tend to be the ones that people have more of a uh, allergic reaction to. Uh, and so it's not just one, there's actually three. So um, that's where uh, if people have an allergy, it's often to one of these ingredients within the, within the, the venom of the bees. Um, some people will not have an allergy some people will some people get that allergy the second time that they get stung they get stung the first time and they don't have a reaction and the second time they stung they have a, a much higher like anaphylactic reaction to that sting um and it, there's really still very little understanding as to why that happens to some people not others we still haven't completely pinpointed the reason the um, mechanism behind that and why some people have a, such a heightened reaction the next time they get stung where others don't <clears throat> uh, and again, there are some really amazing ovipositors out there. This is not an insect that's going to sting you. It looks big and it's definitely something that I think most people would step back from, uh, but it's not one that's going to sting you. This is a giant black ichneumonid wasp. It's in the genus Megarissa. And what you're actually seeing is the three different pieces of its ovipositor, of its ovipositor structure there. So I my guess is this one here on the left is probably the actual uh, ovipositor tube and these two on the right are the stylus and these two on the right are hanging a little bit lower are the um, the lancet. But what these wasps do, and this is the female again, and sometimes if you find a, a dead wasp, you'll see that it looks like the ovipositor is split into three pieces and it's just throwing those three structures because it's no longer alive and its body's no longer holding them all uh, together. Um, but this wasp will do is you can see on the right here, it looks like almost like an oil derrick. It's um, got this membrane that's, that's extending between um, the, the piece of its ovipositor here that's sticking down in the ground and there's actually some dead wood underneath it. But what these wasps do, and this is fascinating, is they are parasitoids on horntail. That's this primitive uh, hymenopteran right here that just popped up. Horntails will lay eggs inside dead wood. Uh, and when they're young are born, they can't digest the wood by themselves. So horntails in some of their, when they lay an egg, I believe it's it's also in their venom, they inject a little bit of a fungus and this fungus will help um, change or uh, change or break down the wood and make it more digestible for the youngsters. What these wasps do is they sniff with their antennae for the smell of that fungus and when they smell that fungus they know that there's horntail eggs somewhere in that wood and then they start poking around um with their stinger now if you thought about the process i just talked about with how hard it takes to get the stinger in it takes a little time obviously a little bit of work 
if you have a big stinger like that, you're going to be spending a little bit of time getting in that wood. So it doesn't happen instantaneously. Uh, the other thing is, once you've done all that work, you want to make sure there's a larva of whatever you want down there so that you can lay your egg on it. Because if you end up laying an egg and there's no larva down there, your egg's going to starve. It's not going to have anything to eat. But ideally, you know, you tag the um, tag the larva and venomate it with some venom that pops out as you're also laying an egg on it. The creature gets paralyzed and then your egg hatches and gets to eat a fresh, undead, not dead, but very much paralyzed uh, larva or other insect. Um, and so all that's happening under the dead wood as you're walking by and you probably won't see that. We saw a lot of, um, I saw at least two or three species of this on a dead wood, a uh, dead log uh, a couple months ago, earlier in the summer. And it's really neat because I've never seen one of these horn tails in our park, but apparently we have them because these guys were in there or these gals were in there uh, attacking the larva inside the wood. So why sting? You know, it took only took me, excuse me 30 minutes to get to that question about stinging insects. But why sting? Um, obviously, hopefully you understand by now, you know, part of that stinging is egg laying. You know, you're laying your egg. Uh, for many wasps, they're <clears throat> parasitoids or, you know, they're hunting for insects that they can then paralyze with their sting uh, and then lay an egg on so that their egg can hatch and eat the paralyzed uh, wasp. Uh, or adult or larva or pupa uh, and feed on them. So they're looking for something to paralyze for their young. So very, very important for egg laying. Um, here's a, I, the text on the left here is from Wikimedia and I just thought, or Wikipedia, I just thought it was easier to use that. I don't know that it's an entirely accurate, but it's, it's a good enough uh, description of it. Uh, this is a different type of wasp from the, the Mangarissa I showed you about. It's, a, it's, a, it's got a smaller uh, sheath, but it's still got a pretty long one out there. If you see a wasp and it's got a really long, what looks like a really long stinger or structure on the end of that abdomen, it's most likely a, an ichneumonid wasp. Um, so this wasp is tapping in the wood looking for a place where the vibrations that it hears back indicate that a, a potential host is underneath there. Um, and then it's going to take this long sheath and and the, um, uh, I forgot the, the words, the, um, the two, the lancets uh, and burrow down deep in the wood. And then once it's got in there, it's going to go in there with its actual ovipositor uh, and stick it in there and hopefully finding a egg to de deposit its larva on. It doesn't want to lay an egg if there's no host down there um, because the the young, the young of the wasp will not survive. Um, predation parasitism. This is another reason obviously to sting. Uh, in this case, Instead of finding larvae that have a, aren't able to move very much, uh, these two wasps are gathering food to feed their youngsters. This is on the left here. This is a local wasp. On the right, it's a wasp from I think India. I think that's where this photo is taken. But it's a it's a really cool looking wasp. And I was looking for one with a caterpillar, and and that fits a bill. Um, but these wasps, uh, these different wasps will go out. They often specialize on something. There's um, Wanted to go out and find caterpillars. Um, this is Celephron. Ooh, I can't remember the second part of its um, Latin name, but it is the black and yellow mud dauber, and I think they've even changed that. Maybe it's yellow legged mud dauber now. Um, and they specialize on spiders, and they're looking for spiders uh, to paralyze. They bring back. They will make a, a a chamber out of mud. They put a few paralyzed spiders in there and lay an egg. Their egg hatches and eats the paralyzed spiders. Spiders haven't died yet, so they're like again, they're still alive and, and you know fresh. Um, and that's what the the uh, larva of the wasp will eat and they'll pupate into adults uh, and they'll repeat the process as well. Um, what's really neat about both these pictures, I want to make sure I say this, is in each of these wasps, you can see they have a very thin waist between the thorax Thorax is the body part that all the legs and wings attach to, and the abdomen, which is at the end of the abdomen, obviously, is where the stinger is. That narrow waist allows the wasp to move its abdomen a lot more uh, and to be very accurate and precise with its stinger. And so that threaded, that thread like waist there can be really, really important in these species. Uh, and even species that don't have a long waist like that, like the, I feel like the, um, Paper wasps tend to not have as long a waist. They can still use those, use their stinger really, really accurately. And so that that quote wasp waist or thin waist is really important in this in this group of stinging insects. Uh, this guy on the left, this is actually I don't know if how many of you recognize it, it's not a very big picture, but this is actually the wall of Gulf Branch right next to the steps. This is some of the quartz and, and the other rocks that are in there. 
and this poor wasp was trying to get this big spider that she had paralyzed up into one of her um, mud nests and could not get the spider past two or three feet off the ground, uh, no matter what she did. And I don't, I don't know if she ever was able to use that that spider or not, but she was working so hard, but the spider was so big and she just couldn't get up there. And again, many of these wasps are able to lift as much as their weight, maybe even a little more um, when they sting their, their um, prey and take it in to feed their young, but there's only so much you can lift. And I think she had kind of, she had found her max at that point. And of course, defense. Uh, I think most people are, are familiar and, uh, you know, probably even less than friendly to Yellow Jackets, unless you're a Georgia Tech fan. I don't know. Um, but Yellow Jackets are, a lot of our Yellow Jackets around here are ground nesters, and, and that can be a real problem at the end of summer. At the end of summer, um, the Yellow Jackets have started their nest in spring. You know, the queen often working by herself. She lays a few cells. She knows she puts in a few cells and puts some eggs in the cells. The cell, the eggs grow into workers. She's got more workers are doing a lot more work. And then eventually you'll get a colony. And at some point in July or August, they start producing. You, I think it's in July even. They start producing queens and drones. Uh, and obviously queens are going to go start new colonies. Drones are the males that will mate with queens. And once they start producing those, they're aggression can really change at their nest and they can be much more um, aggressive in protecting it. And, and, you know, if anybody steps on or near that hole in the ground, they will go after them. And wasps and bees can all release a pheromone that says, hey, we're in danger. And, um, you know, everybody else needs to attack. And the other uh, critters in the colony will respond to that. You know, I showed you that bee sting earlier. Um, and while that that uh, torn out bee sting is pumping in venom into the wound still, it's also producing pheromones that are telling the other bees as well. And the bees will continue to react to those pheromones until they don't perceive a threat anymore to their nest. So once you, so sometimes, you know, killing the bee or killing the, the, the yellow jacket is just making things worse, not from an <gasps> kind of standpoint, like, you know, like we might have a reaction or take offense or be taken aback, but it's, it's literally a, a wave of sense that says, hey, there's danger, uh, and it'll really, really enhance the response of uh, the yellow jackets or the honeybees. Uh, and again, when you've got these big nests, um, you know, we have a lot of solitary wasps, like I've shown you that black and yellow mud dauber, working all hard by itself to get that spider up. And then we have a lot of social insects as well. We got the honeybees, obviously, on the left here. And then this is one of the, the paper wasps on the right. And uh, again, this paper wasp colony was at the corner of uh, the roof above our porch at Gulf Branch, uh, and they were, you know, pretty much uninteresting and, and, and not an issue. And then they suddenly had like everybody emerge and suddenly they had big numbers and it was just a, it was a whole different ballgame and a whole different attitude from them as well. And unfortunately, we had to deal with that because that's right where our entrance was and it just wasn't it wasn't safe for visitors. Um, speaking of safe for visitors, uh, this is an Acri Africanized honeybee. Okay, if you're looking at and thinking, well, what's the difference between that and the the, the honeybee we're used to? Um, not a whole lot in many respects. They're actually smaller uh, than the European honeybees that we use. Um, and, and if I remember correctly, I was reading up on this, and, and I should have put it more in a slide. Um, I believe there's at least like 14 subspecies that are uh, recognized as far as uh, honeybees. I think Italian honeybees are really popular, a strain that comes from Italy. Uh, but the Af Africanized honeybees are actually from Africa, but they're only one of, of two or three. Uh, Apis mellifera, which is our the Western honeybee, is non-native to North America. I don't know if I blew anybody's mind, but I always find somebody um, now and then who who is unaware of that fact, you know, for as much as we learn about honeybees and as important they are to our economy, they are non-native species in North America. Um, there are several species from Europe and there are several species actually from Africa. They're, they're um, pretty sure that they're from uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa. I think they came over, they first came over in 1622. Um, on one of the on one of the ships that came over with Europeans, uh, and there was a, I think a pretty healthy debate in the 17 or 1800s about whether they actually were native because there were so many of them there uh, at one point. I, I think Thomas Jefferson wrote that uh, Native Americans referred to them as the white man's flies. Um, 
because they were only you would only find them around uh, where the colonists were at that time. But obviously, since then they've spread across uh, the entire continent. They've been pretty much naturalized. So you've got this African uh, strain of the the honeybee, and what happens with this this strain where they live? There's not as much. Um, it's harder to find resources, so they have to work harder. They're often more active on cloudy days or in poor weather. Um, they have to work harder to gather it, and they tend to be much more aggressive than uh, some of the other subspecies. Because when you live in an area where big mammals are like, hey, look, honey, let's have some. And it happens all the time. You, you know, when you put all that work in, you tend to work out. And I know I'm very much anthropomorphizing them, but essentially they have had, you know, um, however many, you know, eons of having their food stores um, tried to um, be taken by other mammals. And so they will sting aggressively and quickly and for much longer. Than the European honeybees. So why would anybody think these are a great idea to add to the um, or to bring them over and try to make them with some of the European honeybees? Well, if you remember the part I said earlier where um, they tend to live in areas where it's harder to find stuff, so they're much they're harder workers for, you know, if I keep anthropomorphizing, they they spend and they also spend a lot more time, so they forge longer. They're more efficient at foraging. They often forage again on cloudy or um, in poor weather, you know, even like some rain. They'll go out and forage in that because they have to. And that's what they're that's what. Um, where they evolved, that's what they had to do in order to survive and be successful and pass on their genes. So you've got a strain that is is more aggressive in defending itself, but also um, much more. Uh, efficient and, and better at gathering and gathers more often uh, than the European. And what they thought was, hey, let's take this strain and made it with some of these other strains of European bees and see if we can produce a bee that works harder, works longer, works in poorer weather. And maybe we can get rid of that aggression. Uh, so we'll have a, like a super bee that does a lot more. And I think if for any of you listening who have, you know, paid any attention to anything in science over the last couple of decades, what could go wrong? Uh, well, what happened was they brought into Brazil. Uh, and I forget the, the, the gentleman's name, but it was somebody who was conducting these experiments and they had um, 35 colonies or 35 queens go over, you know, 20 some survived. They had them in a certain kind of structure where they were preventing them from getting out, getting too far out. It was some kind of limiting uh, structure that would prevent them from doing that. Um, and some subset of workers was concerned that they weren't getting out enough and let these bees out and ended up the queens ended up escaping. And now we have Africanized bees in South America. And again, as, as, as I mentioned, they are, can be much, much, much more aggressive than European bees. So as a kid growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, I remember hearing the killer bees are coming. The killer bees are coming. And there were some people that thought maybe the cold weather prevented there were other people thought that's not going to do it because they're such good foragers. Um as far as I know, I think the killer the, the cold weather's kind of kept them in the south. They found them in Brownsville, uh, I think was the first time they were in US soil. Uh, they ended up finding them in a container ship from Venezuela. Um I think it was Venezuela uh, in Los Angeles, and that was a, a big issue. They're trying to do that. And so um, these bees have had an effect on our psyche and it, just in general in uh, in the natural world. So again, um, and this is again one bee. I could do a deep dive on honeybees and, and all these different stories, and they have such a profound effect on us because economically they are so important. Um, and killer, this, you know, the story of the quote killer bees or the Africanized bees is just one subset of that. Um, ideally, we're probably not going to see them, but who knows with climate change? Excuse me, we could see them to start creeping north again. Um, but that's a fascinating story. And again, it all focuses around those stings um, because they sting a lot and they then they react much quicker, and more aggressively than their their European cousins. So let's talk about a couple of stinging myths real quick. Bees wasps can only sting once. This generates again from uh, the mortality of honeybees from stinging us. And that's what's important here. They're stinging us and that's where their mortality rises. We actually have thick skin. You have really good skin that's going to protect you pretty well from a lot of stings. Um, it also protects you from small bites from certain critters. 
But what happens is this um, stinger is barbed and that barb gets hooked in our flesh and it can't be retracted. If that honeybee stung another insect, even if that honeybee stung something like a bird, they can usually retract their stinger. They can get it back, but it gets embedded in our flesh and it gets stuck. And when they try to retract it, you have this mortal injury here on the right. And so because of that, there's this idea that if a bee or wasp stings you, they're going to die. Nope, most other bees and wasps have smooth stingers and they can sting you more than once. As a kid, I got tagged by a, a bumblebee and it nailed me three times on the right shoulder. I have a very vivid memory of, of, of that, uh, of being stung by that bumblebee. Because I remember someone, I remember, you know, as a as a young adult, people were like, yeah, you can only get stung once by a bee. And I was like, no, I got three on my shoulder. Now I know there was a different species than was a honeybee. And so I understand that more, but, you know, people will tell you, Bees or wasps can only sting once, and, and that's not true. Um, honeybees can sting more than once if it's not us, uh, and most other wasps and bees can sting us more than once if, if they wanted to. Um, so that's unfortunate news if you run afoul of some yellow jackets or you know even bumblebees. Um, but again, the more solitary the insect, the less likely they are to sting you. So that's another positive. Um, it's one thing if you're a honeybee, if you're one of these paper wasps, if you're in a yellow jacket hive where you have a large group of critters, and that's um, more of your your mo is that you defend the colony uh and that that's really really important when you're a single you know think of a of uh some of these wasps as like a, you know a single parent and you're the only one responsible for the eggs you're about to lay uh and the food that you're putting into that nest and you're going to be a lot less belligerent or aggressive to something that's so much bigger than you if you're the only one if you're the only provider of that food and no one else is going to help you out um, honeybee sting in swarms. You see this all the time in the cartoons. Elmer Fudd getting nailed there in the in the backside, of course, because that's the funniest place to get stung. Um, and, and I grew up watching Warner Brothers and Hanna Barbera cartoons. You see that all the time, and it's it's not really true. When you see a big swarm of bees, they are often moving to a new location, and they actually tend they're probably no no more. Uh, aggressive might even be less aggressive uh, in the stage because they're very much in that mode of protecting the queen and they're trying to find a, a new place and so uh, generally it's not a big issue um on the left this was a photo i took in cleveland a long time ago on the right this is one i took um maybe a month ago uh during one of our hiking camps i had no problem walking by this it wasn't too close to the trail anyway but i had no problem walking by this with my campers i was much more worried about some of the yellow jacket nests we found at other times uh, i find them to be much more uh, of a concern uh, at the end of the summer. And then all stings hurt a lot. Well, yeah, stings hurt. That's the whole point of a sting. Um, but that black and yellow mud dauber, which is probably, uh, I, I think is generally bigger than a honeybee, it's probably actually going to hurt less because that mud dauber's venom is specifically for paralyzing spiders. Um, it's not meant to be a painful um, reminder, is not the word I'm looking for. It's not meant to be a, a, a painful. Uh, message saying, hey, leave our hive alone, like for honeybees or some of the other wasps. Um, and so if you get stung by a critter that doesn't typically use, by one of these wasps, doesn't typically use its um, stinger as a defense mechanism, it's going to hurt less. I have not personally tested that. I've been stung by yellow jackets and honeybees, and that's about it. Um, actually, maybe a couple paper wasps. Um, so, and it's been so long, I, I couldn't remember what they really feel like. But I, as I understand it, these guys actually typically hurt less than the honeybees. Then you might be saying, how can we tell if something hurts more or less? Well, a gentleman named Dr. Justin Smith was kind enough to make a uh, pain index of all these different insects. He has been stung by, I had some notes here. Um, thought I had some notes here. He has ranked 78 species and 41 genera of Hymenoptera. Um, if you're looking at this, you can see that the, the light yellow is uh, a, a one and the dark, darker, darkest color is a four. And so that's the scale from one to four, one being you know, less painful and the dark one being most painful. Uh, these, these are not, the, the circles are not to um, scale per se, but they are meant to give you an idea of the painfulness of the different kinds of stings. I don't know that he goes out of his way to get himself stung, but he has tried to, to reference it. And again, he it's a method, so he doesn't just, he, he looks at duration, he looks at the kind of pain and, and the actual sensation of the pain. Uh, so it's kind of easy, interesting. It's not a total um, stunt. There are some guys on YouTube that are like, hey, why don't you guys vote on what should bite or 
or sting me next time. And I don't know how uh, how good an idea that is. Uh, but I found this really interesting that he ranks, you know, how long some of these the, the, the sensations go away and appear bullet in 300 minutes, you know, five hours of pain. And that just doesn't seem like fun. Oh, but I thought this was a really interesting uh, scale that I want to share. And you can definitely find more about this up on uh, on the Internet. There's a, a nice Wikipedia entry about the, this pain index as well. Um, but let's get back to all that that grumpiness about stinging insects. Um, they are a concern. I've seen people leave the area just because there's um, insects nearby. I, there are there's a part of me that also feels that it's very important to recognize that there is probably an environmental uh, environmental an evolutionary memory inside us that just like um, you know people that you know, take a second to step back because there's a snake or you know have a, a a fear of spiders. Both of those are animals that have you know, they have species that have venom. Just every species of spider has venom. It's whether they're um, medically serious. And, 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 you know, lots of snakes can be venomous. And so you have these um, evolutionary, whether it's evolutionary or cultural, you have these these deep-seated memories that can that can give you pause. And some people obviously have, a, a you know, a, a, a very irrational fear of them as well. Um, and, and bees are no exception. I, I think it's fair to understand that as, as important as that honeybee and as important as those bumblebees are, and we know they are, we still have this concern. You know, if you've run afoul of one of their their paper nests, this is a little um, yellow jacket nest that was right under the rim of our recycle can at uh, the Gulf Ranch parking lot. This is a big bald faced hornet net nest on a um, frame of uh, playground equipment, which obviously nobody was using that summer. Um, you know, if you've run afoul of one of these, you, you remember pretty quickly uh, and you keep an eye out for that pattern. And that's the point, you know, e even rolling over log and you you have a, a moment where you come across a, a yellow jacket. This is a sole yellow jacket. I'm pretty sure she was a queen. If you look really closely at those cells, you can see there's a couple eggs in the cells. Um, obviously, none of these other critters were bothered by the yellow jackets, but certainly that could have been an issue for us. I rolled this, took the picture, rolled it back. Um, I went back and checked. Uh, uh, like a month later and it was gone and I think they chose another she chose another site to go with her new workers and, and have an underground nest which I was fine with because this is a log I like to roll um, but nature has also given done us a favor and has provided these kind or not kind but very um, obvious warning markings these bold stripes which are a warning in nature says hey leave me alone um, or there's going to be consequences. Obviously, with stinging insects, you get stung. With a skunk, you get sprayed. You smell really, really bad. Uh, if you if you get that in your eyes, it's it's a whole other story too. So, you know, it's a, a noxious spray. It's getting stung. Uh, so these are really, really important. And this is um, a pattern that's so ingrained that I think people have a reaction to it. But it's such an important pattern that it's shown up in other species. This is a uh, uh, on the top and on the bottom left, these are both surfid flies, which are flower flies, uh, which spend a lot of time on uh, nectaring at flowers, uh, and they look just like bees, you know, especially to the casual observer. If you look really close, you can you can figure out they're not bees. But the point is, if you see something and you look and there's stripes and you think, oh my gosh, that's a stinging insect, you're going to leave the area. You're not going to be like, hey, I should look really closer and just make sure that this is going to be a painful sting. And so they're depending on you not noticing very much. Uh, this one in the bottom right is a locust borer, which is a type of beetle, um, which I believe this is meant to be a bee or wasp mimic. And I'll tell you on goldenrod, it also is pretty good uh, camouflage. Um, and so these are all insects that will you know, are trying to look like a, a scary wasp or a bee. This one in the top here is often called a news bee. Again, it's a, it's a Virginia, is it a giant Virginia hoverfly? Uh, the G genus is Milesia. Um, and I've seen these several times in many places, and they are a very large fly, and they have a loud, they have loud wings, and when they're in your face, they feel like, feels like there's a bee there in your mug. Uh, they've all, they also have been called a news bee, because um, supposedly they would stop, fly in front of your face and tell you the news uh, in the morning, which I think was a neat little folklore. Um, but you don't just have to have stripes in order to imitate a wasp. There are some other insects that look very wasp-like uh, or even bee-like, but that don't need the stripes. This is a, a Midas fly, uh, and it looks very much like a wasp, and it's thought that its uh, coloration and shape is meant to um, have potential predators think it's a wasp, uh, even down to the orange if you can see there, there's slight orange patches on the beginning of the abdomen. Um, so that coloration helps a lot of other critters as well. Um, 
and if I haven't convinced you yet that they're worth your interest, they do provide some uh, really good environmental services, obviously pollination. I don't think I have to sell anybody on how important honeybees are, but even uh, and bumblebees, but even wasps do pollination. They're not as good at it because they're not as fuzzy, uh, but even wasps and bees uh, and many other kinds of bees, not just honeybees and bumblebees, are, are pollinators and are really, really important pollinators. Uh, some of them also will help in pest species control. Wasps have been used in many different cases to help reduce uh, certain pest species. Uh, the wasp on the right has a plant hopper, and the wasp on the left has this caterpillar. I was watching this wasp to take a picture. This is at Fort C.S. Smith. And I must have spent five minutes more than I should have trying to get the picture of this wasp. And all of a sudden it stopped and started eating. And I'm like, what is it eating? And I never saw this caterpillar in all the time. I was waiting for this wasp to settle down. Um, and how it spotted that caterpillar, which is with this amazing camouflage, I have no idea. Uh, and the caterpillar probably is also has no idea. And would have been upset if it's not dead at this point, um, but that was amazing. And some multitask. This is a four banded stink bug hunter. Um, and they they attack stink bugs, which again, it's mostly native species, so it's not that big of a pest species, though they do they do remove uh, insects that some people might consider pests. Hopefully they get the brown marmorated stink bugs, which are non native, uh, but they're also a pollinator as well. You can see it here on a, on some mountain mint in one of our gardens. Um, so many of them will do two very helpful things. Um, and then yellow jackets, as, as much as they're reviled and as, lot, as much as people don't like them, they are part of the, nat the nature's cleanup crew. So when they're obnoxiously in your face, you know, at some outdoor event or at a zoo or wherever you go and you get some food and then you get the yellow jacket surviving, they're just doing what they're trying to do, which is gather food, whether it's plant or animal material that they could take back to their colony. Uh, but they do do a lot of cleanup. And it, and also, if you're not a fan of the uh, bald face hornets, uh, not to pit, pit uh, you against another insect, bald face hornets tend to prey on yellow jackets. So they do have uh, an upside as well. Um, and again, uh, I know I'm, I'm right on eight o'clock here, but if you give me just half a second, I do feel like there is something to be said for just good old fashioned appreciation that nature is amazing. Um, those yellow legged mud dauber wasps, you can sit on our porch and watch them fly over to the pond, come back with a mouthful of mud and begin to create their nest. And again, they're 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 um, multitaskers just like. Uh, what you call it. they're multitaskers, just like some of those other wasps. You know, they do they spend their day building their the um the nests, then they have to go out and hunt for spiders or insects to provision the nest with, and then they've also got to get some food for themselves. So they're getting rid of some, you know, spiders. If you don't like spiders, they're also pollinating, uh, and then they're working really hard. So they I think it's it's pretty impressive what they do. This is what you can do if you don't spend the whole day watching Netflix. That's all I'm saying. Um, so see here you can see they've got a couple of uh, tubes that have already been closed up. It looks like there's actually four there above the one that's still open. And so this is the one that she's currently working on. Fly over to the pond or wherever it is, get a mouthful of mud, come back and continue constructing it. And eventually you'll finish with a big mound of mud that's got several chambers underneath there with with new wasps. Um, I always like to ask the kids in my program, like, did your parents love you enough to build your entire house one mouthful of mud at a time? And I never get a yes out of them. Um, you can see those kinds of nests on our porch at Gulf Branch. If you go to TRI and walk across the, the big bridge over the little bridge, the Potomac there, instead of going on the trails, if you cut to the left and there's a little social trail there that you can cut down to the water's edge, duck under the pond, you're gonna uh, duck under the pond, duck under the bridge, you're gonna see a ton of different kinds of mud dauber wasp nests. The, the black and yellow one like I just showed you, which I think this is too, I don't think that this, Wasp here is actually probably looking for prey or something to grab. I don't think it's actually making this nest. You can see a bunch of them underneath there, including some of the organ pipes as well. So this is an organ pipe mud dauber wasp. She does the same thing. Fly to a spot, grab some mud, get a mouthful, come back and start constructing, constructing the nest. You can see here all these little lines, at each line of mud that she's making there, one mud line at a time. And the same thing, she's stinging. And I'm not sure if they prefer insects or spiders if they have especially as well, but whatever their arthropods are that they're their nail, you know, that they're um, stinging and paralyzing to bring it in. They do that and then they seal them up. Uh, and then, you know, if you catch them early in the next year or late in the summer, you can see how many chambers there were in each tube. Uh, some of them 
do the same thing underground. A lot of these guys, I've seen this kind of wasp. I thought I had a picture and I did, but I see this kind of wasp um, taking uh, caterpillars under the ground before as well. So they're constantly busy, constantly working, and it's hard to get good pictures as well. Uh, and then the bald faced hornets, you know, that looks like a you know big round basketball full of you know, made out of paper. But if you look at the inside, there's several layers of cells. So there's a lot of work being in there. And again, they were making paper, I guarantee you, long before we ever were. Um, and then you got the intelligence of wasps. This stink bug hunter uh, can find its old, the, the hole where it was digging, even if it gets covered up. They have amazing senses of perception. Um, and again, these wasps I mentioned earlier, these paper wasps, there's evidence that shows that um, certain kinds of polistes, which is the genus of paper wasps, uh, recognize other members of their hive by their face. So they can do facial recognition, even though they don't even have a brain like we do. It's just absolutely stunning what what some of these critters can do. And I think it, it's worth uh, your time to, to keep an eye out on that. Um, so thank you for joining me this evening. I'm going to escape out of that and get back to teams here uh, and see if anybody had any questions. I'll check the chat. Well, it doesn't look like there's any questions there. I'll uh, ground us to a yellow jacket. Should I let them be or try to get rid of them? Or will they go away on their own? Well, eventually, you know, everybody that's there is going to leave. And then when I don't know if they'll come back the following year. Oh, you're welcome, Allison. Thank you. Um, I will tell you, and, and I'm not a fan of using chemicals, but when we have an issue with um, yellow jackets, especially along the trail, I got to spray them because I can't, you know, you get somebody nailed. Or you get the wrong person nailed and they're allergic. It's just it's one of those things you just can't avoid it. So, Ruth, if there's somewhere that you can leave them alone or even fence it off or, or rope it off and they're not going to be bothered by anybody, great. But if they're in a high traffic area, um, you're going to have to make that choice about whether you want to keep them there or not. You know, it's that's a tough one. Um, if you know, if we get around spraying and not spraying, great. But sometimes they're just in the wrong spot. So. Uh, I hope that's true, Joanne. I, I think it might be, but sometimes if that spot's really good, you might get another colony that starts there as well. I don't, I think the, the queens from this year will move on to the next, um, but sometimes, uh, you know, but you could also have somebody that finds it back. One thing to Google, if you really like to be freaked out by really large uh, colonies of stinging insects, is to look up the super colonies of, of yellow jackets, because sometimes in the south, if they don't get a cold enough winter. The queens from last year don't die. And I read this article where there was this somebody had on their property this disjunct car, and it was completely full of yellow jacket nests because they had several mild winters. Uh, this is south of us. And they just had a, a ridiculous amount of yellow jackets and, and queens and nests in there, and they seemed to tolerate each other. Yeah, you could do that. Absolutely, jo Joanne, that's a great idea. You could flood that nest at night if you got enough water. Definitely, if you're ever going to deal with a yellow jacket nest, uh, do it late at dusk, you know, or very, very early in the morning when it's cool and they're not yet active. Uh, and at the end of the day, it seems to be better because they're probably tired and it's cool. In the morning, if they're just starting out, it's no good. So, any other questions? Very good. Well, thank you all for joining me. Uh, appreciate it. Um, a quick note I have kept promising uh, recordings and it's been a very long and very busy summer, uh, especially with not having a, another full time naturalist for most of the summer. Um, we have recently um, hired a, a new full time naturalist. She started a couple weeks ago, uh, so stop by and say hi to Hallie when you get a chance. Um, uh, but more importantly, uh, I got a little more time to do some other stuff now, so hopefully I'll catch up on these and get these uh, recordings posted uh, sooner rather than later. And again, if no one has any other questions, uh, thank you all for joining me and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Ken. Uh, you're welcome. And thank you all for the kind comments in the in the, the chat. I always read them and I appreciate that. Oh, um, sorry, there is a question. Uh, Noreen, they're called Africanized bees and not African because they were trying to breed strains. And so you had these strains that they were bred and then they escaped. Uh, and so they have um, they're a combination of, you know, they have some of the genetics of these different strains, uh, different uh, subspecies of honeybees, but they still have that aggression. And so that's typically how they refer to them.
No problem. Thank you, everybody. Glad you could all, all could all join me. I'm actually going to go ahead and end this because I got to do some uh, some timesheet stuff. So you all have a wonderful night and I uh, hope to see you next month.